Hi everyone, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Rebecca, otherwise known as Hypnohare Online, and this is podcast episode number eight, where I'm going to be sharing a few finished objects and the progress on some of the whips that I've been working on. So as I just mentioned, I have a few finished objects that I finished within a day of each other, which kind of surprised me, but I I actually didn't have that much left to do on both of the projects. They were kind of just languishing a bit, so I just needed to dedicate an evening to finishing them. Uh, and now I have two finished objects, which is great timing because I'm hoping that I can still wear them while the weather is a little bit chilly. So let's just jump into the first finished object. The first one is my Sharpay beanie. This is a pattern by Crea Dia Studio, and it's one of the patterns in Lane Magazine's 52 Weeks of Accessories book. Uh, so this is my second version, and um, I'll share the, the first one that I have here because it, it's a little bit more of a modified version. So this is the one that I uh, test knit in the magazine, and then this is my second version with the boucle brim. So the yarn that I use, I use um, all scrapped, which is great, but I still have some left over. So I am either going to knit a second beanie or I'll have to find another project for these uh, scraps. So for the um, body or the main part of the hat, I use uh, loops and threads, cozy wool, merino, uh, held with Wendy Air, which is a, a bit of a thicker mohair. It's 200 meters for every 25 grams. Uh, so I held those two together for that. And then for the brim of the hat, I used um, Knit Picks Alpaca Boucle Bear yarn. So it was the undyed boucle. And I held it with the, the Wendy Air. So um, I, I can't really speak to project cost, or I guess I could, but I really didn't use that much of my scraps. So I feel like it doesn't really make sense to try and calculate project cost, but it was fairly inexpensive because it was scraps from previous projects. For this hat, like I said, I already knit it before, so I was pretty familiar with sizing, but the yarn that I was using was fairly different than this one. So this one is um, Seneskar and Sunday held double with a Drops Kid Silk mohair. And for this one, uh, the Loops and Threads Cozy Wool Merino is, a, I would say, like a light DK weight yarn held with the mohair. So I knew that it was going to act a little bit different, so I sized up in the hat sizing, so I knit a size three, which is the largest size available um, in the pattern. And I also sized down my needles actually, because I was knitting this with uh, the Cozy Wool Merino, which is a superwash merino wool. So I knew it was going to grow a bit. The pattern suggests a four millimeter needle. So I just sized down half a millimeter size for it. And I'm happy I did that. Uh, and listen to my intuition, I guess, because um, I was thinking that the hat would grow a bit with blocking, uh, and it did. So it's now at the proper circumference. Before blocking, it was very tight on my head, <laughs> and it's still pretty tight now, but it fits a lot better. I also did a few other modifications. I knit the main part of the hat, the body of the hat, two centimeters longer, because what I realized from my first version is it's definitely a shorter brim and that works out pretty good I think like I wear this for certain occasions when it's not too cold outside but it doesn't fully cover my ears so um, I don't really wear this when it gets too cold so for this one I knit the body of the hat two centimeters longer before I started the brim and then um, for the the brim of the hat I use um, the boucle yarn and I also didn't work the plisé stitch. I just thought because it was already boucle, the plisé stitch wouldn't really show very well with this, this yarn because you can't really see any stitch definition. So I just thought it wasn't really worth the effort to work the plisé stitch because it is a little bit more involved. So this is just um, stockinette. I'm really happy with this hat. The hat, as I already mentioned, is constructed from the top down. Uh, so you cast on with a magic ring cast on and then you work these increases here uh, at four even points of the, the hat. And I really like this construction method. I think it makes the hat go by a lot quicker. Um, a similar hat to this is the Oslo hat, which is constructed from the bottom up so you knit the brim first. 
and I think that this hat is easier to try on as you go because you can work the increases at the top until um, you think that the circumference of the hat works for your head and you also get the most fiddly parts of the hat done out of the way first. What I find is I've knit a few Oslo hats in the past and um, I just end up procrastinating the top because I just don't really want to do all the, the decreasing. So I think this one's good because while well, you have the highest motivation when casting on a project, you already got the most difficult part out of the way. Uh, and it's just a really nice construction. So I will uh, undo the brim now. Um, I, I'll i maybe try it on this because it's not really supposed to look like this. So um, the way that you knit the hat is you uh, work from the top down and then you work a short row similar again to the Oslo hat you work a short row to start working reverse stockinette so the stockinette flips in direction and I believe that that's done so the fold of the hat um, is, is easier that's where the natural fold will become um, and then from there this is the end because I switched from uh, the cozy wool merino and mohair to the boucle and and mohair and I actually had to do the brim of this hat twice because I thought that it would work to hold the boucle double stranded but once I had done a decent amount of the brim I realized because this hat is double folded the hat would just be way too thick the brim of the hat would be way too thick um so I ripped back and then ended up just doing the boucle and the the mohair and then you knit that for a certain uh amount and then after that once you cast off at the bottom you fold the brim in half and then you seam it to the bottom right here before uh, in between the reverse stockinette and the boucle. However, I didn't do that yet. <laughs> I actually have my ends here. Um, so I, I'm still considering a finished object even though I didn't weave in the ends because I haven't fully figured out how I'm going to secure it. So when I had tried to fold the um, brim and then sew it down, I don't know, I'm just having issues with the tension of it I I don't know what it is this one I was able to do quite nicely as you can see um, or I, I think it looks quite nice um, the the seaming here but with this one I am getting a very weird tension and it's making the brim a lot shorter if I don't really know it's hard to describe but basically I haven't found a way to make it work and I realized that you are able to still fold the brim of the hat and it stays pretty secure like this. Um, maybe because it's not the plisé stitch, but actually um, it's it's working pretty well without me seaming it down. So for now, I'm gonna just not seam it down and we'll see, and if it doesn't stay secure while I'm wearing it, then I'll find an alternative method. Maybe I'll sew it down with like thread or something uh, instead. But yeah, really happy with this hat and I'm really excited to wear it. It's actually snowing a lot outside as I'm filming right now, so this is gonna be perfect for my afternoon walk later today. In terms of the pattern, I don't have the 52 Weeks of Accessories book. I just have access to this pattern because I was a tester, so I have just the Sharpe beanie pattern, and I think it's written very well. It's very clear, easy to follow, and um, there's video tutorials for more complicated parts of the pattern like the magic ring cast on So I can't really speak to what the final pattern looks like in the book But at least the version that I followed was very clear and easy. I think it's a little bit more I guess difficult to uh, Get this pattern because you do have to purchase the the book But there were a few other patterns that I was eyeing that I really like in that 52 weeks of accessories book I think it's pretty versatile compared to other books that Lane Magazine has published because there's a wide range of accessories that are in it. So if you have a few that you're interested in, um, I think it's a pretty good deal actually to, to get the book. And I really recommend and I really like this hat pattern in that book. My next finished object is also another cozy accessory and it is my Sunday Socks by Petite Knit. So uh, these socks were my first pair of socks. I thought it was a great experience because it's knit with worsted weight. So it went by very quickly and I got to know a little bit more about the ins and outs of sock knitting and uh, heel and toe construction. So uh, I really recommend and I liked that this was my first sock pattern. Um, so in terms of the yarn that I used, I use Knit Picks Wool of the Andes um, 
worsted weight yarn, which is a 100% Peruvian Highland wool in the shade Haze Heather. This is how much I have left uh, for each of these socks. I just knit from the two balls of yarn separately. So I have this much left from, from both. Um, and this yarn I purchased during one of Knit Picks's, um big sales, the semi-annual sales that they have. So I think I got these for like around three US dollars. So I'm gonna say it's like around four dollars Canadian each. So this sock cost me eight dollars in total to knit, which I think is quite a bargain <laughs> for a pair of 100% um, wool socks. So I'm happy with that. I will say though, I'm not sure how this is gonna hold up. I think I mentioned it in my last podcast because this is 100% wool. There's no nylon in the yarn that's gonna help reinforce the socks. Um, I received some suggestions to use Saniskarn Perfect, which is a similar gauge to this, or maybe a lighter, a uh, bit of a lighter weight. I think it's maybe like a heavy DK, but that has um, a wool and nylon in it. So I think if I were to knit these socks again, and I didn't have yarn and stash that could be suitable for it, I'd probably look into that Saniskarn Perfect, but for now, I'm happy to have used these two balls for my stash and this, these socks. I think the color is really fun and I really like the heathering in uh, this colorway. I think it looks really nice. In terms of the pattern, I think this is a really popular pattern. I'm sure many people have knit it before, but uh, I'll just mention it quickly. It's a uh, top down two by two sock pattern. So you cast on um, at the top here with a long tail cast on and then you're knitting two by two for the leg of the foot. Then you work a heel flap and gusset, and it's not a um, slip stitch heel flap and gusset, it's just stockinette. And then after that, you work the uh, gusset decreases, and then the rib just transitions to be just at the top of the foot, which I like because I think maybe it could be a sensory thing where, I don't know, I, I just like how it's at the top. I think it would kind of bother me if it was at the bottom when I'm walking with these socks on. So it's just at the top, and then you work a... Um, traditional toe decrease uh, for the bottom of the toe, and then you graft a close at the bottom uh, with Kitchener stitch. Uh, so pretty simple sock construction. Like I said, I think a heel flap and gusset is pretty popular. So it was nice to learn that uh, with a heavier weight um, yarn. I did do a few modifications to these socks. Uh, as always, I feel like I always try to modify the pattern a bit or Maybe don't, I don't try to, but I, I always find that there's a few modifications that I would like to make. So with these socks, I was trying to follow them like almost to a T because it was my first pair of socks. I was quite unfamiliar. Um, I knit the size uh, uh, EU 39. I have about a seven and a half uh, US size foot. So um, that all the stitch counts I kept the same as what the pattern recommends, but for the leg of the sock, I knit it to 17 centimeters. Um, I didn't want it to be too tall, and that was for two reasons. Uh, the first is I have like proportionally very large calves <laughs> compared to the rest of uh, like my height and, and the rest of my body. So uh, when I had started knitting one of these socks uh, and I knit the leg of the sock longer, it was really tight along the top of the, um, sock where it was hitting at my calf so I decided to just shorten it and also I think that they're knit quite long so they're more of like a slouchy sock but I didn't want that I wanted the sock to be like quite um, tight to my foot uh, and not be too loose at the top or too slouchy I guess at the top so yeah I knit that shorter and then the uh, second modification that I did is I know you can maybe see it here on this side and on this side but I ended up modifying the um, toe decreases to be more of an anatomical toe. So actually, maybe I'll hold them up here. They look really funny <laughs> when I hold it up like this. Uh, but as you can see, um, or I hope you can tell from me holding it up like this, but I'll just hold one so I can use my hands to point. But um, this side of the toe has more decreases than this side. And I came across this technique from Paper Flower knits on Instagram. She has a reel that explains why you may want to work an anatomical toe and uh, uh, the pattern modifications or instructions that you can do to work it on any sock pattern. So I always, uh, I saw that reel and then I saved it and I always kept it at the back of my mind because I thought that that would definitely help with um, the 
fit of a sock just based off of my foot shape. So I decided to try it for this pattern. I did have to modify it a little bit. So the um, instructions that she has in the reel is meant for a fingering weight sock. So in Petite Knit's uh, pattern, you're supposed to work the increases on both sides of the um, toe of the sock evenly. And um, you do that until you reach a certain stitch count and then you cast off the rest with Kitchener stitch. But I wanted to follow the anatomic toe uh, pattern or instructions and uh, in that reel there's instructions for how to modify this for a fingering weight sock and since this is a worsted weight sock there's less rows before um, you have to cast off the, the sock because the rows are taller with a worsted weight so I did have to modify slightly in that uh, video I'll link it down below but you work increases every other round um, until you reach a certain point and then you start doing a few increases on this side for the um, other side of the, the toe, but I ended up just doing these decreases um, every round. Um, I hope that that's not a little bit uh, complicated. I hope I explained that correctly. Uh, I'll include also the Ravelry project down below as always, where I will include the instructions of how I did the anatomic toe below as well. The finished fabric of this sock is quite thick though, since it is worsted weight. Uh, from what I hear, um, hand knit socks, even with fingering weight yarn, is they still end up being a little bit thicker than um, commercial socks that you can buy in the store. And these are definitely very thick. <laughs> I think that they work really well as like a slipper sock around the house, but I don't know how comfortable I'd be wearing them out because they are very thick, so they are very warm. And also they just make my feet a little bit bigger like both in terms of look and it's a little bit tight to fit into some of my shoes so I definitely like these socks to wear around the home but it will just be kind of like that like a cozy at home sock to wear so for my next few pairs of socks I'm excited to knit some at a, a tighter gauge um, so it creates like a thinner finished fabric that I can actually wear out of out of the house but all in all, really happy with this pattern. As always with petite knit patterns, they're very easy to follow. There's the video tutorials online, which were really helpful. I didn't really understand the written instructions for uh, the heel flap and gusset. I was glad to have a video tutorial for this specific pattern that I could follow. I think now that I've knit a pair of socks before, I could probably follow it in the future without needing that guidance, but really helpful that it was there for the first time using this technique. And now moving on to whips. The first whip that I have to share today is my Wave Sweater by Spectacle Streak. There was the Wave Sweater knit along that ended mid-February and uh, I was uh, kind of, I just cast it on at the tail end of that knit along. So I kind of am losing a little bit of motivation for this sweater, but I really want to finish it soon because it is a thicker color work sweater. So I'm hoping that I'll still be able to wear it and not have to put it away until next fall. Uh, but I have made some progress on on the sweater. So um, since the last time I podcast, I was still working the raglan increases. I haven't split yet for the body and sleeves, but I'm almost there. I'm just working the final few raglan increase rounds. So I think uh, just looking at the fit right now and when I tried it on, um, it's going to be a pretty deep raglan sweater, uh, but that's okay. I, I like how this is going to be a little bit more oversized. Um, just because of the thicker fabric. So uh, that's my progress so far. The yarn that I'm using is these three yarns right here. So for the main part of the sweater, my mohair's uh, stuck. Uh, the main part of the sweater, I'm using Lion Brand uh, Fisherman's Wool in the shade um, Nature's Brown. This is a 100% wool. And then for the contrast color for the waves, I'm using uh, nitpicks aloft and then originally lovely fluff together. So really liking this color combination, but I am having issues with the pattern itself. So as I mentioned, um, I haven't split for the body and the sleeves yet, but I have done one full wave motif, which is this curve right here. And I've started the second one down here. So um, I think I mentioned in my last podcast that I thought that this um, color work sweater was a great first color work sweater, which I kind of still think it is, maybe, <laughs> or at least um, it's a little, it's more simple than I thought. 
but I don't find the instructions to be very clear, especially for the curve of the wave. So there are a few things that I wanted to point out with this sweater. So I didn't think that this was an issue and that's why I didn't mention it in another podcast because I kind of thought it was normal for the color work charts to not show the increases. So this pattern is very concise. There's just a very small color work um, chart at the very top of the pattern that explains how the wave motif is formed, but it doesn't show how to keep the wave motif going while working increases. And that's something that I thought was kind of normal in color work sweaters. As I mentioned, this is my first time doing a color work sweater. So I didn't really know until I thought, um, let me take a look at another color work sweater that I have in my pattern library, the Lume by Sari Nordlin. And then I saw in that pattern, the color work charts show the increases. And I was looking at a few others that I have in my library and they all have increases worked into the chart as well. So then I realized that this one doesn't and I don't really know why it doesn't um, because I think it's really helpful if if designers include it. So kind of disappointed with that. I was still able to figure it out, but that's only because uh, someone had mentioned this in their uh, Ravel Ravelry project notes. <laughs> so uh, I was able to figure that out. I just thought it was normal or like it's typical, but I don't think so. I think a lot of designers uh, that have more detailed patterns explain that, which is really helpful. So there's two things that I want to point out while working the um, color work motif and the raglan that if you have tried to cast on the wave sweater and you find it really confusing, uh, I, I think it'd be good to know these two things before going into knitting this pattern. So the first is, um, as you can see here, I think it's a little bit more clear as you work more of the raglan, but the wave is not continu continuous across the raglan. Um, so as you can see, like with this sleeve here, trying to <laughs> show it in an okay angle. It's also really helpful too, because I've um, done a mid project block, so I don't have my stitches on needles right now. So it's a little bit easier, I think, to see the motif, but there's the wave pattern here, but then it ends at the raglan increase, and then it starts again for the front. And then that's the same across, like for the second sleeve, there's the wave motif, it ends at the um, raglan, and then it starts again at the back. So the pattern doesn't mention that you need to restart the color work chart motif at each section of the raglan for the front, the sleeve, the back, and the sleeve again. It's not explicitly stated. Um, at least I am doing that and the color work worked out. So I think that's how you're supposed to do it. But yeah, it's not fully clarified in the pattern. It just says to work the color work sections according to the chart. So that wasn't very helpful, but I was able to figure it out because someone had left that comment on the Ravelry project. And again, I thought that that was normal, but I think that um, the designer maybe should have explicitly noted that in the pattern. And another thing that isn't mentioned in the pattern is that your color work is offset by one once you do the raglan increase because the increases aren't charted in the pattern. So I think at this point, I've knit this much, I've gotten used to that where I just have to know, uh, I just have to follow the wave motif and because it's very visually striking, I think it's very easy to tell if you've made a mistake, but you have to kind of do that work yourself where you're figuring out how to work the increases while maintaining the wave pattern. So yeah, just those two things to note that when you're starting the color work motif, the color work uh, charts repeat at each section of the raglan and also that the um, color work shifts by one every time you work a raglan increase. Like I said, it's my first color work pattern and I was able to figure that out, but I definitely think that maybe this should be explained more in the pattern and that is not really the norm. So in the future, I probably wouldn't recommend this as a first color work sweater. I've just gotten this far in the sweater, so I'm going to keep doing it, but it was a little bit of a struggle at the beginning trying to figure out how this color work should look. Someone also left a really helpful comment in my last podcast saying that it looks like the color work sections are rippling quite a bit. And so I did do a mid project block after I finished uh, the first wave and then started the second. Basically when I ran out of my um, first ball of fluff, I decided I'll just do a mid project block. 
So I was able to knit this much actually with just one ball of fluff, which is 145 meters. So pretty good progress, I would say, with just one ball. Um, but yeah, I did the mid project block and I think that it really transformed the color work. It was really rippling before. I'll maybe put a picture um, here of what it looked like before I blocked it. But after that, you can see that the um, yarn has really bloomed and the tension is a lot more even. The mohair and the fluff in the contrast color is really fluffy. The texture is starting to stand out a lot more after blocking. So really happy with that. I'm glad the color work has worked out because I would be very upset <laughs> having to frog back. I think if the tension didn't work out, I probably would have frogged this project completely and I wouldn't have done it again, <laughs> uh, just from the frustration I had at the beginning. Um, but yeah, really happy this is working out. I'm on the last few raglan increases before splitting for the body and the sleeves. And I think at that point, the color work chart is going to make a lot more sense because you're not having to do any increases anymore. So you just have to follow what the chart looks like and not have to do that um, thinking about what the um, how to maintain the, the motif. My next whip that I have to share, I have in my honey bucket bag, which made a revival when I pulled it out, sharing it at my last podcast episode and I realized it would work really well as a project bag so glad that I cast on the my honey vest so I can start using this as a project bag but uh the whip that I have to share is my blouse number one light by my favorite things knitwear um so I've made some pretty good progress on this whip because it's knit on six millimeter needles so a very loose and open gauge I split for the uh sleeves of the the blouse here they're just on stitch holders now and then now i'm onto the body so the yarn that i'm using is knit picks aloft in the shade koi which is a very bright electric corally orange shade so uh, i'm using this yarn i chose this yarn because it is an extremely soft mohair i think it's very comparable to uh, phil Colonna tilia or isagra silk mohair it's very soft not scratchy at all so thought it would be very suitable for the blouse because um, this is just one strand of mohair that I'll be wearing next to skin so um, as I mentioned it's a very loose and airy gauge uh, blouse number one light by my favorite things knitwear recommends that you knit the blouse um, with two strands of mohair but I am modeling this off of the Oro Top by Rose Knitwear, but I wanted a design that was contiguous and top down. So that's why I'm knitting the blouse number one uh, light, but I'm just holding one strand of mohair. So it's a little bit more of an open gauge. Do have some progress on this sweater. I've knit the um, uh, saddle shoulder and the sleeve caps, and I've just separated for the body of the blouse. I just realized <laughs> These sleeves just came off of the stitch holder as I was holding this up. So I will fix that after I finish <laughs> uh, this section of the podcast. Um, but yes, I finished the um, increases and now I'm just knitting in the round for the body. And this uh, construction is very similar to the April cardigan if you've knit that before, um, where you do the rapid increases for the saddle shoulder and then there's different intervals for the increases along the sleeve so you're working increases to shape the armholes but also the body of the blouse so it's a little bit more involved you kind of have to pay attention to to that in the the pattern because it does change I would say like quite rapidly or you just you have to keep an eye on it um, as you're working those increases and I do have one critique of the pattern because of that so um, in the pattern, there's the different intervals of increases and um, my favorite things knitwear, the designer says you work this interval rate this many times before going on to the next section. But at the end of those sections, she just lists what the total number of stitch counts are. Like for example, you should have 180 stitches before you move on to the next set of um, increases. And I, while well, I appreciate that those are there, I do like when designers also include the stitch count uh, intervals for the different sections of the blouse. Like for example, you would have 180 stitches, X number of stitches for the sleeve, X number of stitches for the back, X number of stitches for the front, uh, for two reasons. The first is I find that maybe I'm a little bit more of like a lazy knitter where it's usually if I have 
the correct number of stitches for the sleeve or for the back, I'll use that as an indicator. If that's correct, I kind of know I'm on the right track. Um, and I don't have to count 180 stitches all the way around. Um, so yeah, it just saves time. I don't really like counting the total number of stitches. And then B, if something is wrong, then you will know where you had messed up. You would know if you had worked an extra increase on the sleeves where you shouldn't have to, or an extra increase at the body if you shouldn't, if you shouldn't have done that. And with the total number of stitches, like it can be helpful to know if you did it incorrectly, but then you don't know where. So I would just have liked if the pattern included that. There are some designers that are very consistent in doing that. And that's why I really like their patterns. Like um, Haley of Ozetta always does that. And I find that that's really helpful. Or maybe I've just gotten used to that pattern writing style. So when I follow other designer patterns and they don't have that, I just don't find it as helpful. But that's only like my minor critique of the pattern. Otherwise, I'm really enjoying it. I feel like I'm being very negative of pattern writing uh, as I just talked about the waist sweater now this one but that was just something that I noticed with this that I wish that it had because I did mess up with the increases and it took me a lot of time to figure out where I had gone wrong with the increases. I ended up needing to frog back uh, and then just try and work my way up until I figured out where I made the, the mistake and that's because I did an extra round of increases where I shouldn't have. Um, but yeah, so I did end up needing to frog back this blouse a little bit. Um, Rebecca of um, Moving Stitches left a really helpful comment um, in my last podcast as well, saying that mohair is a lot easier to frog when it's cold. So um, she recommended that you put it in the, the freezer. Um, and then when you take it out, it should be a lot easier to frog. So when I did have to frog this, I was actually outside. I was waiting for the bus. <laughs> Um, and that was a lot easier to frog than the first time that I had um, cast on stitches and then needed to frog back and I said it was really difficult. Knitting uh, or frogging back when mohair is colder is actually a lot helpful. It probably wasn't as cold as in a freezer, but just being outside in cooler temperature, it ended up being easier to frog. So I just thought that was really funny and I think that that advice is true. I think that it is really helpful. So if I ever need to frog mohair in the future, I'll definitely use that freezer hack. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> and my last whip that I have to share is the My Honey Vest by Wool & Beyond. So I do have a few updates on this vest. Quite a few things have changed uh, from my plans. So the first is I mentioned in my last podcast that I um, wanted to knit the My Honey Vest for Knit City, for it to be my Knit City outfit. And um, unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, uh, I'm no longer going to Knit City anymore. Uh, and that's because I have, I booked a trip to Vietnam and Thailand and it kind of just the best timing for that trip fell around the time of Knit City. So I had to pick um, either going to Knit City during that weekend or extending my vacation, I could have gone longer. Um, so yeah, I chose that. So that's why it's, it's fortunate because I, I feel like that was the best decision for um, for me and my travel plans uh, but that means I'm no longer going to Knit City unfortunately but I am still going ahead with knitting this vest because I really want to to make it. Um, so that's the first update and then the second update is my yarn plans have changed once again for this vest. <laughs> I feel like this is a never-ending struggle with this vest. I really hope it's going to be worth it but I did have to change my yarn choice so I'll just pull up the yarn now. The Plotilope has stayed the same. So with the My Honey Vest, it's a two color honeycomb brioche that uses three different colors. So there's the main color, which is the um, most visible part of the um, honeycomb brioche. There's the background color, which is underneath the, the um, main part of the honeycomb brioche and then there's the contrast color which you use for the horizontal back panel for the edging along the the vest and also the eye cord ties so um, the Plotilope yarn that I picked has stayed the same it is um, in the shade ivory beige picked it up from the knitting loft so uh, I finally have it in my possession so that was the um, that that is the main color but I decided that I didn't want to actually use the Retro Zaria Rosa Pomar Doro yarn for the um, contrast color because 
that is the only fingering weight yarn that I have in stash where I have more than 1400 meters and so I didn't really want to break that up in case I wanted to do a more intricate pattern in the future because I can't get that yarn easily here in Canada so I didn't want to break that up when I went to the knitting loft um, I was thinking if I see a yarn that will work well then I'll, I'll get it so I kind of had that in mind and then when I went to pick up the yarn I made sure I had enough time to window shop so I was showing the plan to an associate working there and we went around the store and she helped me find a great contrast color to use. This is from the brand Momonoki Yarn and it's their uh, fin wool, I believe it's called, in the shade Milk Tea. Um, and this wool is on the pricier side. It's a hand dyed wool from, I think Germany. Let me check the yarn tag. It's a 100% wool from Finland and it's hand dyed in Germany. So this skein of yarn is um, 360 meters for 300 grams. I got one um, hank of, of this yarn and it was um, $40. And that is more pricey than what I usually spend for a lot of my, my projects. I tried to knit a little bit more on a, a budget, but I thought, you know, once in a while, it's nice to splurge, especially for a special project like this. and. Uh, when the associate had pulled these, uh, this yarn off the shelf, I just thought it was such a perfect combination. I couldn't get it out of my head, so I ended up getting it. So yeah, the contrast color has changed and the background color has also changed. So uh, my initial plan was to use this as a background color and then the Sizzler Git uh, sock yarn in the shade Mary Poppins for the background color for a more low contrast version of that brioche. Um, but when I had done the swatch, you really couldn't tell, like the brioche was blending in with the background color. And I thought that it was not showing the stitch texture and it's quite a bit of effort to do honeycomb brioche. So I want the brioche to pop at least a little bit. And it was doing a disservice, I think, to these speckles because this yarn has some lovely speckles of like a navy and bright orange and you just really couldn't see it. So I decided to swatch with two other yarns. Uh, I have them here. So the first is Artfill Americana DK in the shade Copper. This actually used to be my Riley tee, which I frogged. It is a little bit bittersweet because that t-shirt was the first ever test knit that I did for um, Rachel Knits things. And I, it, it's always gonna have a very special place in my heart, but I really don't like, um, DK weight wool t-shirts. It was always just very warm, didn't have very good drape. So I ended up frogging it because I'm trying to find another project that's going to work better for this more special hand dyed yarn. So I ended up swatching it in this middle section here. And then I thought, what if I also try and swatch with this blue yarn here, which is the swatch at the top or the section at the top of this swatch. This is also a Sizzler Get Sock yarn in the shade Night Reef. Um, my boyfriend got me both of these yarns when he went to Denmark. Um, and so I thought that I'll, I'll just swatch it and then we'll see what happens. So I um, knit that on the top of this swatch and I was going to pick between the Copper and the Night Reef. But what I actually think I'm going to do now is I'm going to alternate them I think randomly. So there's going to be a few rounds of the copper, a few rounds of the night reef, and then I'll just switch off for the background color of the brioche. I think it's going to be really fun and I like the how the two colors play off each other. There's a little bit of like a warmer tone. I wouldn't say a very similar shade to the copper, but there's like this strand here that has this warmer shade integrated into the light blue and navy blue. And so I think it kind of all pulls in together and it really makes the brioche pop a lot more um, and it's I think it's gonna be a really fun combination this is the back of the swatch in case you're curious to see the breakups of the color but yeah the plan is now to use the night reef and copper randomly so after all of that I just think it's really funny because in my winter knitting plans I had totally different vision for this vest with totally different yarn I was thinking of using my um, let Lopi with the Andres alpaca yarn that I got from the CNE and then Mary Poppins and then now like three months later I'm using a totally different combination 
but I'm really happy with how that landed and I'm excited to see how the vest is uh, going to work up. So um, this is what I have so far of the My Honey Vest. I kind of thought that I would have more progress on this um, for this podcast, but the double knitting for the horizontal back panel is taking so much time. It is so slow going, but um, you for the horizontal back panel, you are knitting it with double knitting. And I think it's to make that section more secure uh, because that's where you pick up stitches for the back of the vest and then for the front. So I have done a horizontal back panel like this before for my air tee uh, by Ozetta, but that was just stockinette. It wasn't a double knit. So yeah, this is going a little bit slower than I thought, but um, it's it's important that this is going to hold up for the rest of the, the vest. So you do this horizontal back panel with the um, contrast color here. So I've just uh, caked it up and um, you're supposed to do it on uh, 3.25 millimeter needles, but I don't have a pair of 3.25 millimeter needles. So I ended up sizing up to size 3.5, which I think makes a pretty nominal difference. It's only a difference of 0.25 millimeters. Um, but yeah, I sized up to that and I'm, I realized that I was still off gauge. So I ended up needing to cast on um, uh, six more stitches for the double knit. Um, and the pattern explains both how many stitches to cast on and how wide this horizontal back panel should be. So that was helpful to know, to realize that I was off gauge. I also realized through this swatch that I am off gauge as well for the two color honeycomb brioche. Um, this is knit with three millimeter needles and I have too many stitches in 10 centimeters. So I'm going to need to size up. I think even more than um, to 3.5 millimeter needles. I think I might even have to go up a full um, millimeter needle size up to four. So uh, we'll see, but this swatch was very telling that I was off gauge, so that was helpful. So yes, hopefully I finish this uh, back panel soon and get out of this endless double knitting section uh, and get started with my honeycomb brioche with my new plans. Um, I will say though that I am on a low buy year. I did not forget about that. Part of my low buy year rules um, I don't think anyone's really tracking or paying attention to that, but I just want to touch on giving a little bit of an update with this project. So part of my low buy rules that I set for myself is that I would finish two sweater quantities before purchasing one sweater quantity or having the option to, or three accessories before having the option to purchase one accessory quantity. And so since I finished uh, my, my rule for myself, I finished the two sweaters, this I'm considering a sweater quantity. And that is working really well for me, that system. So I just also wanted to share, um, if you are also starting on a low buy year, I think that that's pretty popular this year. So if you're getting started on it, I'd love to know your progress as well because those rules are really helping me and keeping me on track. I did make this acquisition or purchase, but um, it's uh, still net negative. So that was really helpful to keep track of. And um, I have no regrets for this vest because I am really liking the new plans for it. Okay, and I think I'm about to wrap up the podcast at this point because uh, apart from those two skeins, I don't have any other um, acquisitions and I'm also saving my plans for my spring knitting plans with Sash Yarn Video. So yeah, no plans in this video because I think it would just be a little bit redundant of what I'm going to share in that one. That one should be out um, next week. Hopefully I'm going to get it out soon because it is um, spring. So uh, yeah, I will be releasing that soon, but that's why I'm not going to share any in this video. So yeah, look out for, for that video. I also just released a um, spring knitting trends video, um, and that's not something that I thought I would film, but I was noticing some trends. So if you want to check that out, I will also link that down below or maybe attach it somewhere in, in the thumb cards here or in the... I think it's called the card section, <laughs> not the thumb card. Uh, but yeah, I'll attach it somewhere in this video so you can check that out if you're interested and I will see you in my next video.